April 16th, 2025, L minus 14 days. The 24 astronauts on their way traveling towards Mars were quickly approaching the red planet. As they looked out the window, they could start to see the resolved disk of Mars. They could even sometimes make out quick dots that they thought might be the two moons, although they were not certain at this point in time. On this particular day, they were preparing to execute the final course correction, which would take them from a two-year orbit around the sun and bring them directly back to the planet Earth to one that would intersect the planet Mars, allowing them to land on the red planet. As these astronauts were going through their final checklist, an alarm went off. The engineers performing this review were at first worried that they had done something incorrectly, but it quickly became apparent that this was nothing the astronauts could have possibly done wrong. The sun had emitted a coronal mass ejection that was pointed in the direction of the two spacecraft. This coronal mass ejection consisted of high amounts of radiation which required the astronauts to take special precautions. They had not yet done this on the journey and they were hopeful that it would not happen, but still they were unfortunate to have it happen during this transit. The astronauts quickly decided what their best course was to follow the procedures. The procedure involved orienting the spacecraft such that the rocket of the engine was pointed directly at the sun. This would allow for the whole bulk of the spacecraft to protect them against the radiation in addition to the rocket fuel. This would provide the most mass between the astronauts and the sun that they could possibly manage. In addition to this, they would take shelter in a special storm shelter, which happened to be the places where they slept. It was decided that the astronaut quarters would be in the radiation shelter, at least for this initial mission, until it was better understood how the human body would react to the radiation of deep space. This radiation shelter was in the interior of the spacecraft and it was surrounded by the water tanks used to hold the water that the astronauts would drink and otherwise use, not only for their transit between Earth and Mars, but also while they were on the ground. This water would provide significant amount of radiation shielding it was estimated that only 1% of the radiation that entered the back of the spacecraft would be able to successfully transit to the astronaut shelters, thus taking their dose from a very high dose of radiation to one that was much more manageable. As the astronauts quickly finished their procedures prior to this maneuver, they gathered in waiting to determine what would happen. The 24 astronauts in the two separate ships were able to talk in near real time with each other, and they discussed what this would mean for the future mission. They knew that they had to perform this course correction quickly, or else they would be forced to return back to Earth without ever setting foot on the surface of Mars, despite their being close enough to see it resolved. However, they knew that because of the rotation of the sun, the storm would not continue to point at the astronauts for very long, and within a day or two, they should be able to be cleared and perform their maneuver. At L minus 12 days, they were clear. NASA uplinked a new trajectory correction for them to make, which they performed, and there they were able to target at last the red planet. They were going there, and while they could still return back to Earth if they needed to in a contingency, they were now committed without making some form of a rocket correction. L-1 day, the astronauts were performing their final simulation prior to landing. For the last several days, they had been practicing the simulation. In this particular one, everything went perfect and they felt like they knew everything that they needed to do to land. They had been practicing landing back on Earth before they had left, but that was six months prior and they needed this additional practice. L minus four hours. The two cargo missions set previously each launched one weather balloon into the atmosphere. This weather balloon would allow for a more accurate representation of the atmospheric pressure and winds on Mars. The atmospheric pressure on Mars can vary depending on the season because some of the air can actually freeze at the poles. Depending on the global temperatures, it can vary fairly significantly, even some day to day. 
With knowing the exact pressure and winds at the various altitudes, they could refine the atmospheric model used by the spacecraft and improve the course correction. The data from the weather balloons would be sent to the approaching spacecraft through the cargo ship from which they were launched. The two had a direct link at this point in time and were able to communicate. L minus one hour. The spacecraft was quickly approaching Mars. The astronauts were seated safely in their specially designed entry and launch chairs. These chairs were designed to take a high amount of g-forces. In addition, they could rotate to best take the g-forces depending on what configuration the spacecraft was in. When it was in the launch configuration, the spacecraft thrust was coming through the rocket engines up through the spacecraft. And thus, the astronaut's back would be pointed to the rocket engines. The human body is best able to take g-forces coming through the chest, and thus that was the correct orientation for them during launch. This would also be the correct orientation for the final landing. However, on the final approach, the spacecraft would be entering the atmosphere of Mars with its belly pointed in the direction of motion. This would tend to cause the g-forces through the belly of the spacecraft and not through the rocket engines, which they were normally accustomed to. Thus, the chairs had to be able to rotate in order to keep the force of gravity at the correct location. The astronaut chairs were also able to keep an eye on their vital systems. Part of the purpose of this first expedition was to determine how the human body would react in the Martian gravity being only 38% of that of Earth's. No one had previously had that force of gravity for any length of time, and short of building a giant centrifuge in space, there was no way that they could test it without physically visiting the planet Mars. At this point in time, they were in communication with NASA to ensure that all was correct. Everything was coming back nominally. At L minus 15 minutes, the laser link antenna safely stowed itself into its correct orientation for launch and landing attempts. As the spacecraft continued towards Mars, it rotated into its final trajectory. Prior to this, the astronauts had been able to see the approaching Mars disk growing bigger and bigger quite rapidly. But in this orientation, they could only sometimes catch a tiny glimpse of Mars through the bottommost windows if it happened to be oriented that direction. L minus seven minutes, they began the seven minutes of terror as it is known when they were entering the atmosphere of Mars until the time they would touch down safely on the surface of the planet. At first, they barely noticed anything. Soon, they began to feel real gravity force, which they had not felt before. This gravity force was through the slowing down of the spacecraft, and it was not true gravity per se as you feel, but it was the closest they had felt to this gravity since they had left the planet Earth. As they continued, the g-forces began to build up, becoming even higher than that of Earth's gravity. 3, 4 Gs was the target range, although they might have some brief periods of time that were even higher than this. The wings of the spacecraft continued to monitor to keep its position in this correct orientation, which would allow it to safely enter the atmosphere of Mars. 99% of the energy needed to be bled away by this aerodynamic motion. Only the last 1% of energy could come through the use of the rocket power. They had some margin but this was what the optimal profile was. As the spacecraft began to descend, it communicated back through the communication satellites near Mars. However, they didn't have the high data bandwidth. They could only transmit very low data bandwidth, which was primarily to indicate what phase of the landing that they were in. The astronauts could look out the windows and see the fiery red glow that you see when re-entering Earth's atmosphere. This glow really impressed them with their beauty, but they knew how dangerous it could potentially be. As the landing approached closer and closer, the astronauts at last had a lessening of the g-force to something just over half of what the g-force you feel on Earth. The spacecraft was continuing to descend, but it was primarily belly down at this point in time, just to keep its velocity 
It had reached the terminal velocity, which would increase as they lowered down towards the surface, but it would not remain too significant. As the astronauts continued down, they knew that soon they would approach the turnaround point, where the spacecraft would orient itself vertical for the final landing. The pilot and commander particularly were paying careful attention and keeping an eye on what their landing zone actually was. They relayed this information periodically to the crew, but they were so mesmerized based on the whole scene that they weren't paying particular attention. At this moment, they could look up and see primarily the dark of space, although they could start to see the slight glow that you could only see when you're in an atmosphere. Finally, their chairs began to rotate as the spacecraft began to rotate. The spacecraft would then continue down vertically for its final descent, and the bodies were rotated accordingly. The astronauts could look out through their feet at the windows and there start to see some of the surface of Mars. Some of the astronauts could even make out a distant cargo ship, which they hoped was the correct cargo ship where they were intended to land. As they continued down, one of the engines failed. This was not a significant problem. The ship had many engines and it could fail two of them without any significant issues and up to four if they were in the correct configuration and still continued down to land. However, this was still a cause for some concern. The spacecraft continued to descend, and due to this lost engine, was somewhat off the target. The people of Earth were able to view this through two cameras primarily. Three laser comlinks could be extended from this area towards Earth at any one time and be received. One of the channels was devoted to the ship, even though we would not be able to transmit for most of the entry. They still wanted to reserve this in the case of an emergency. The other two laser comlinks that were transmitting in real time were coming from the base station ship that had landed previously, which was carefully tracking the spacecraft, and also from one of the scientific rovers that had been downrange on the correct trajectory. All of the spacecraft that were in this vicinity were carefully monitoring this entry procedure, and this entry would be the most documented of any entry previously done on the surface of Mars. Some pictures had been made of the entry of a spacecraft onto Mars, but this was all that had previously been done. As the spacecraft continued its descent, the wings were locked into their final position for landing. The landing legs were extended down, and the spacecraft continued to descend and slow down its approach. Finally, the roar of the engines, which had been so deafening up until this point, cut silently, and there was a slight jolt in the spacecraft. The astronauts all looked around at each other, thinking, is this it? Is this it? The commander and pilot quickly realized that everything had gone anomaly. They were now on the surface of Mars. They established a communication relay through the other cargo ship that had been sent previously back to Earth. They could only establish voice at this point in time. They would have to wait for the laser comlink for video. But the words from the commander echoing the Apollo 11 flight were issued. Houston, this is Mars Base Alpha. The heart of gold has landed. As the world heard these words, they cheered. The cheers were held in every major location throughout the world where many people gather. In Times Square in New York City, in London, in Tokyo, in Moscow, in Los Angeles, everywhere people were cheering. This landing had been watched by an estimated 2 billion people, making it the most televised event in human history. A higher percentage of this was even watched than the Apollo moon landings. Humanity had done it, and they had done it as a combined group of many nations, led primarily by an American company and by NASA, but they had done it. The next day, the second spacecraft carrying humans landed, only a kilometer apart from the previous one and almost exactly on target. It did not have an engine failure. The astronauts were glad of this, for they realized that 
the spacecraft that had the engine failure would probably be left on the surface of Mars, at least for the time being, and all of the astronauts would go home in the other spacecraft. They had known before they had left that probably only one of these spacecraft was coming home immediately, and they would all be moved into that one, but they knew now which one of the two spacecraft it would be. For their first few days, they were confined to the spacecraft. For the first 24 hours, they were primarily monitored carefully, ensuring that their vital signs were healthy, that their heart rates were healthy, they performed EKGs, they performed blood samples, they performed muscle tests, and many, many different things to ensure the health of the 24 astronauts that had just landed on Mars. After 24 hours of being on the surface, they'd begun the operations to lower humans. However, that would still take another week. And that will come in a separate episode. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have about Mars exploration or anything else in general. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.